Good afternoon. The theme of this series of TEDx Talks is on what keeps me up at night. There are a number of different topics that resonate, especially in the current pandemic. From health, to energy, security, and technology. One common ground for all of these, however, is the similar objectives to facilitate our survival and the survival of our societies. This is the one topic that remains true independent of political, religious, or any other differences in vision among us. How do we survive? Within this reality, no one can stand up and say one topic is more important than the other. And no one can stand up and say a topic does not matter as much as the other. Because these all involve our survival and are all important. This is the very first principle of democracy, the very first step in peaceful coexistence amongst a multicultural and visionary people. The truth of the matter is that the world we live in is a complex one, one that involves multiple fronts in the war for survival. Technology matters. It matters to enable us to live longer, better, easier, and be better prospects. Bloodshed is a threat, a threat that needs to be dealt with towards a longer lasting peace. Another, as important of a matter, is the war we have to win against nature. This is a battle that has very limited chance for retrial, one that the enemy has an embedded advantage and a right to win, one that requires extraordinary efforts and a unifying message for all those involved, one that is not limited to me or to you or even to our civilization. Rather, this is the one battle that unifies all those living on this planet for a longer lasting survival. We have been fighting this battle for the entire life of our species. But now, we have identified a name for it that resonates across the globe. One that everybody relates to, and it is called climate change. What do we really mean by climate change? Where did it come from? Who is responsible for it? These are all the questions that we keep asking ourselves and the ones we keep trying to answer in elections, in research, in developing a plan for the future. But not all of these are the right questions to ask. Climate change is not a single phenomenon that we need to address. It is not an isolated process that needs to be reversed. It neither is a socio-political challenge that we can tackle in demonstration or marches, nor it is a scientific problem that can be handled by researchers and scholars. Not alone. It is a different phase of our conflict with nature that has been happening through millenniums. It requires all of us and it requires all our attention. The best that we can describe and define climate change is through facts and observations. What we can observe is that, for example, the average temperature of the planet is increasing annually. Here is the data that shows since 1980s, the temperature has gradually increased and stayed up there. This makes it a factual observation, not an interpretation, not a political argument, but a real observation that we can measure. This does not mean that we have an increased temperature everywhere around the world. It means the average temperature in our planet is increasing. We can also measure the level of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere over the years using ice samples from Antarctica. These are the data that we have collected with known uncertainties in scientific terminologies, based on scientific methods that have been proven. Is this the cause for climate change? Well, that would be an interpretation and not an observation. Here, I will just stick with the facts and observations and leave out any personal or scientific interpretations of these data to other experts to do so, since this does not serve the purpose of our discussion. Consequently, to the rising temperature, ice starts to melt. As expected, we observe that the Arctic ice levels start shrinking. As that happens, the sea levels start rising. 
This is a major issue that is observed daily in Pacific islands or seaside countries and cities where the sea levels are taking away available land from people every day. You can put a stick on the beach and you can see it happen. This is an observation. You look at the beach and you identify that life for those people is changing every day. We also have extreme weather events that are happening more frequently. This not necessarily mean hotter weather is going to happen everywhere. It simply means that the strange events happen more frequently because the ocean temperature is changing because of the melting ice. And the consequence of that, the weather systems change. These are only a few examples of the observations we have made to account for what we call our changing climate. And that's the magical word, changing. All around us, everything is changing. And the reason for it is because the climate is changing. This implies that the world around us, being temperature, being weather, our everyday life, all different aspects of it, is changing on this earth. And these changes, what we can observe, these are what we can agree on and we can quantify. This is independent from a political view. It doesn't matter who you believe in, this is what you can see. I was an official observer at the United Nations climate meetings in 2015. My first hand experience with the negotiations in these meetings was that of astonishment followed by disbelief and finally an understanding of the huge barrier between politicians, scientists, and industry leaders. The main problem though was that negotiations are not done honestly toward a common ground, but rather to simply put the burden on the other party. There are also the issues of feasibility, scientific and technologically sound goals, and the discussions on what we are aiming for and fighting for that we cannot achieve in the time. The UN is investing greatly on research to prove that climate change is real. Well, they should be focusing on research and means to address the effects we are already observing and experiencing today. Let's say we prove that climate change is real and identify the person responsible for it, all beyond any doubt to anybody who is listening to us. Does that solve a problem? Does that bring nations together? Or does that make any difference whatsoever in addressing this crisis? No, it does not. It just divides people. We have seen this play throughout our history, and we have played similar roles in the past, over and over again. This time, instead of repeating the same mistakes, let's change our approach. Let's focus on the problem rather than the sideshow of who is to blame and how to make them pay for it. This would be a political argument, and we need a scientific and social approach to solve the issues associated with climate change. Our negotiators and decision makers need to have a better appreciation of what each and every motion they're taking and aiming for means in terms of techno technological capabilities and scientific merit, if they want to really fight the issues of climate change. If we set goals that are not achievable, then those who lose in this battle are us. We should aim for those goals that we can be sure to meet in the period of time we set forward. I can list a number of different problems that I can see with the current approach that we have and with the current strategy from both a scientific and a social political point of view. One, some objectives are technologically and scientifically impossible to meet in some of these cases. For example, Greenhouse gas emission reduction for airliners. Marine transportation of goods and how we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. And how greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions affect global trade and economy de economies and economic developments by 2050. Is it achievable? We have to think about that. Two. We should enable technology transfers to underdeveloped nations. 
so that they do not need to pay the same cost to achieve the same level of technological advancements as we have paid. It will be faster, it will be easier and less costly, both for the environment and otherwise. Technological embargoes are problematic. We need to open a technology bank for transfer of scientific and technology developments across borders. Population control is another problem, an important issue that we need to address in our developed nations. Sustainability in energy production is as important as it is to look at the consumption of that energy. Number four, populism. The burden should be on industries and governments rather than people in the first place. For example, if we try to enforce carbon trade and uh, carbon related policies at a time of economic difficulty, it will backfire. We need to be vigilant of public perception and we have to start with what matters the most today and people can deal with that. We need to focus our research and development on the industries and technologies that matter the most. It is not about only how we generate power, how do we extract energy, it is also about how do we transform it, how we transport it, and how do we consume it. All of these matter. And this all requires new and revolutionary approaches to the concepts, rather than just making the small tunes into the technologies to make instead of making a big difference. Let's just start thinking and realizing that new technologies that we need are thinking out of the box. We need a new definition for innovation. Because what we need goes beyond our current understanding of the term innovation. These set forward a fruitful approach in solving a common problem. The same way we got together to solve the current pandemic, we have to get together to solve the problems we face with climate change. Answering the question of who did it has never been a unifying approach in any conflict or crisis. Finding the person to blame is the middle step in a long list of psychological steps and processes that are faced by humans when they're trying to address a crisis. We are finally at the point of acceptance. It is only now that we start looking for means to adopt and to address the problem or the challenge we have in hand. This is the nature of human beings. This is our psychology. If you're going to fight with nature, you better take advantage of our own. We have come a long way to be here. But to accelerate this process going forward, there is only one approach that I can recommend. Finding a common ground amongst all our people. This common cause is valid for all those that are involved with this idea. One unifying voice that resonates across the political, social, economic, and scientific communities alike. One that aims not to address these polarizing questions that I have listed in the beginning of my talk, but rather to deflect the need to answer them. All while addressing the very nature of this crisis, one that goes beyond the bounds of green movements and extends past the prosperities that are promised by the oil and gas and energy enthusiasts. A world that satisfies all those that are involved, but only slightly. Oh, that is the magical trick to a monumental challenge. That is, if one side is all happy, it only could mean that others, all of their needs, are not met at all. The common ground is clear here. The common ground that which unifies all the parties involved is technology and technology advancement and improvements to our current systems to design better, higher efficiency and better performing mechanisms to lower the cost associated with any of these energy systems. This is the language that all those that are involved can agree on. A better efficiency means more profitability. That is good for industry, is good for economy, and is good for the people. Therefore, governments will take advantage of that too. A lower cost in our energy systems would mean a better economy and a better, happier society because of it. If we can reduce our footprints on the environment, that means that our lives are going to be more comfortable. And if the technology that we need to get there is there, it's a win for all of us. Why do we need to wait for bloodshed to push us to invest in technologies that can revolutionize our lives in the future? This has been the trend for years and centuries. 
war and the fear for extermination and the need for survival has pushed us to invest in technology developments that gave us the edge in the war, but in return over time, they became relevant in bettering our lives during the time of peace. Now we have an opportunity to come together towards designing better systems, engineering higher efficiency technologies, and bettering our lives without the actual bloodshed of war, but with the real danger for survival. This is an ugly enemy. It does not hunt you in history. You can't find one just like it. But it slowly makes its presence known in the shape of what we can all call as a common name, climate change. I only pose one question to all those from either side of the spectrum who fight for or against policies related to climate change. What would you lose to transform a polarizing disagreement to a unifying cause in climate change. Let's look at climate change from a new lens, one that allows us to make this crisis an opportunity to bring us together and to unify us towards a better future for all of us, for our children and for our grandchildren. What that enables technology developments that help industries thrive and economies grow all with the reduction in environmental footprint. Let's work together to elect the right people for the right job. Thank you.